Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, Dwarfkar Lee B.W. The 5th of January 1928 to the 4th of April 1979 was a Pakistani politician who served as the ninth Prime Minister of Pakistan from 1973 to 1977, and prior to that as the fourth President of Pakistan from 1971 to 1973. He was also the founder of the Pakistan People's Party PPP and served as its chairman until his execution in 1979. Educated at Berkeley and Oxford, Bhutto trained as a barrister at Lincoln's Inn. He entered politics as one of President Iskander Mirza's cabinet members, before being assigned several ministries during President Ayub Khan's military rule from 1958. Appointed foreign minister in 1963, Bhutto was a proponent of Operation Gibraltar in Kashmir, leading to war with India in 1965. After the Tashkent Agreement ended hostilities, Bhutto fell out with Ayub and was sacked from government. He founded the PPP in 1967, contesting general elections held by President Yahya Khan in 1970. While the Awami League won a majority of seats overall, the PPP won a majority of seats in West Pakistan. The two parties were unable to agree on a new constitution in particular on the issue of six-point movement which many in West Pakistan saw as a way to break up the country. Subsequent uprisings led to the secession of Bangladesh, and Pakistan losing the war against Bangladesh allied India in 1971. Bhutto was handed over the presidency in December 1971 and emergency rule was imposed. When Bhutto set about rebuilding Pakistan, he stated his intention was to rebuild confidence and rebuild hope for the future. By July 1972, Bhutto had recovered 43,600 prisoners of war and 5,000 square miles of Indian held territory after signing the Simla Agreement. He strengthened ties with China and Saudi Arabia, recognized Bangladesh, and hosted the second organization of the Islamic Conference in Lahore in 1974. Domestically, Bhutto's reign saw Parliament unanimously approve a new constitution in 1973, upon which he appointed Fazal Alai Chaudhry president and switched to the newly empowered office of Prime Minister. He also played an integral role in initiating the country's nuclear program. However, Bhutto's nationalization of much of Pakistan's fledgling industries, healthcare, and educational institutions led to economic stagnation. After dissolving provincial feudal governments in Baluchistan was met with unrest, Bhutto also ordered an army operation in the province in 1973, causing thousands of civilian casualties. Despite civil disorder, the PPP won parliamentary elections in 1977 by a wide margin. However, the opposition alleged widespread vote rigging, and violence escalated across the country. On 5 July that same year, Bhutto was deposed by his appointed army chief General Zia-ul-Haq in a military coup before being controversially tried and executed by the Supreme Court of Pakistan in 1979 for authorizing the murder of a political opponent. While Bhutto remains a contentious figure in Pakistan's history, his party, the PPP, remains among Pakistan's largest. His daughter Benazir Bhutto was twice elected prime minister, and his son-in-law and Benazir's husband, Asif Ali Zardari, served as president. Topic: <laughs> Early life. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto belonged to a Sindhi family. He was born to Sir Shah Nawaz Bhutto and Kurshid Begum near Larkana. Zulfikar was their third child. Their first one, Sikandar Ali, had died from pneumonia at age 7 in 1914, and the second, Imdad Ali, died of cirrhosis at age 39 in 1953. His father was the Dewan of the princely state of Junagadh, and enjoyed an influential relationship with the officials of the British Raj. As a young boy, Bhutto moved to Worli Seaface in Bombay to study at the Cathedral and John Connan School. He then also became an activist in the Pakistan movement. In 1943, his marriage was arranged with Shireen Amir Begum. He later divorced her in 1945, however, in order to remarry. In 1947, Bhutto was admitted to the University of Southern California to study political science. In 1949, as a sophomore, Bhutto transferred to the University of California, Berkeley, where he earned a BA honors degree in political science in 1950. There, Bhutto became interested in the theories of socialism, delivering a series of lectures on their feasibility in Islamic countries. During this time, Bhutto's father played a controversial role in the affairs of Junagadh. 
Coming to power in a palace coup, he secured the accession of his state to Pakistan, which was ultimately negated by Indian intervention in December 1947. In June 1950, Bhutto travelled to the United Kingdom to study law at Christ Church, Oxford and received an LLB, followed by an LLM degree in law and an MSc, honours degree in political science. Upon finishing his studies, he was called to the bar at Lincoln's Inn in 1953. He was fellow of barrister Ijaz Hussain Batalvi who later appeared in his case as prosecutor. Bhutto married his second wife, Nusrat Ispahani, an Iranian Kurdish woman, in Karachi on 8 September 1951. Their first child, Benazir, was born in 1953. She was followed by Mortaza in 1954, Sanam in 1957 and Shanawas in 1958. He accepted the post of lecturer at the SM Law College, from where he was also awarded an honorary doctorate in law by college president Hassan Ali A. Rahman before establishing himself in a legal practice in Karachi. He also took over the management of his family's estate and business interests after his father's death. <laughs> Political career In 1957, Bhutto became the youngest member of Pakistan's delegation to the United Nations. He addressed the UN Sixth Committee on Aggression that October and led Pakistan's delegation to the first UN Conference on the Law of the Sea in 1958. That year, Bhutto became Pakistan's youngest cabinet minister, taking up the reins of the Ministry of Commerce by President Iskandar Mirza, pre-coup d'état government. In 1960, he was promoted to Minister of Water and Power, Communications and Industry. Bhutto became trusted ally and advisor of Ayub Khan, rising in influence and power despite his youth and relative inexperience. Bhutto aided his president in negotiating the Indus Water Treaty in India in 1960 and next year negotiated an oil exploration agreement with the Soviet Union, which agreed to provide economic and technical aid to Pakistan. Topic. Foreign Minister Bhutto was a Pakistani nationalist and socialist, with particular views on the type of democracy needed in Pakistan. On becoming Foreign Minister in 1963, his socialist viewpoint influenced him to embark on a close relationship with neighboring China. At the time, many other countries accepted Taiwan as the legitimate single government of China, at a time when two governments each claimed to be China. In 1964, the Soviet Union and its satellite states broke off relations with Beijing over ideological differences, and only Albania and Pakistan supported the People's Republic of China. Bhutto staunchly supported Beijing in the UN, and in the UNSC, while also continuing to build bridges to the United States. Bhutto's strong advocacy of developing ties with China came under criticism from the United States. President Lyndon B. Johnson wrote to Bhutto, warning him that further overtures to China would jeopardize congressional support for aid to Pakistan. Bhutto addressed his speeches in a demagogic style and headed the foreign ministry aggressively. His leadership style and his swift rise to power brought him national prominence and popularity. Bhutto and his staff visited Beijing and were warmly received by the Chinese, and Bhutto greeted Mao Zedong with great respect. There, Bhutto helped Ayub negotiate trade and military agreements with the Chinese regime, which agreed to help Pakistan in several military and industrial projects. Bhutto signed the Sino Pakistan Boundary Agreement on 2 March 1963 that transferred 750 square kilometres of territory from Pakistan administered Kashmir to Chinese control. Bhutto asserted his belief in non alignment, making Pakistan an influential member in non aligned organisations. Believing in pan-Islamic unity, Bhutto developed closer relations with the likes of Indonesia and Saudi Arabia. Bhutto significantly transformed Pakistan's hitherto pro-West foreign policy. While maintaining a prominent role for Pakistan within the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization and the Central Treaty Organization, Bhutto began asserting a foreign policy course for Pakistan that was independent of U.S. influence. Meanwhile, Bhutto visited both East and West Germany and established a strong link between two countries. Bhutto preceded economical, technological, industrial and military agreements with Germany. Bhutto strengthened Pakistan's strategic alliance with Germany. Bhutto addressed a farewell speech at the University of Munich, where he cited the importance of Pakistan and German relations. 
Bhutto then visited Poland and established diplomatic relations in 1962. Bhutto used Pakistan Air Force's Brigadier General Władysław Tarowicz to establish the military and economical link between Pakistan and Poland. Bhutto sought and reached to the Polish community in Pakistan and made a tremendous effort for a fresh avenues for mutual cooperation. In 1962, as territorial differences increased between India and China, Beijing was planning to stage an invasion in northern territories of India. Premier Zhou Enlai and Mao invited Pakistan to join the raid to illegally wrest the Indian state of Jammu and Kashmir from India. Bhutto advocated for the plan, but Ayub opposed the plan, he was afraid of retaliation by Indian troops. Instead Ayub proposed a joint defense union with India. Bhutto was shocked by such statements and felt Ayub Khan was unlettered in international affairs. Bhutto was conscious that despite Pakistan's membership of anti-communist Western alliances, China had refrained from criticizing Pakistan. In 1962, the U.S. assured Pakistan that Kashmir issues will be resolved according to the wishes of Pakistanis and the Kashmiris. Therefore, Ayub did not participate in the Chinese plans. Bhutto criticized the U.S. for providing military aid to India during and after the 1962 Sino-Indian War, which was seen as an abrogation of Pakistan's alliance with the United States. Meanwhile, Ayub Khan, on Bhutto's counsel, launched Operation Gibraltar in a bid to liberate Kashmir. It ended in a fiasco and the Indian armed forces launched a successful counterattack on West Pakistan Indo-Pakistani War of 1965. This war was an aftermath of brief skirmishes that took place between March and August 1965 on the international boundaries in the Ran of Kutch, Jammu and Kashmir and Punjab. Bhutto joined Ayub in Uzbekistan to negotiate a peace treaty with the Indian Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri. Ayub and Shastri agreed to exchange prisoners of war and withdraw respective forces to pre-war boundaries. This agreement was deeply unpopular in Pakistan, causing major political unrest against Ayub's regime. Bhutto's criticism of the final agreement caused a major rift between him and Ayub. Initially denying the rumors, Bhutto resigned in June 1966 and expressed strong opposition to Ayub's regime. During his term, Bhutto was known to be formulating aggressive geostrategic and foreign policies against India. In 1965, Bhutto's friend Munir Ahmad Khan informed him of the status of India's nuclear program. Bhutto reportedly said, Pakistan will fight, fight for a thousand years. If India builds the atom bomb, Pakistan will eat grass or leaves, even go hungry, but we Pakistan will get one of our own atom bomb. We Pakistan have no other choice. In his 1969 book The Myth of Independence Bhutto argued that it was the necessity for Pakistan to acquire the fission weapon, and start a so-called deterrence program to be able to stand up to the industrialized states, and against a nuclear-armed India. Bhutto obtained a manifesto and made a future policy on how the program would be developed and which individual scientists would start the program. Bhutto selected Munir Ahmad Khan and Abdus Salam a Nobel laureate and Ahmadi Muslim and despite Bhutto's constitutional designation in Pakistan of Ahmadis as non-Muslim that Aman Ahmadi was the first and main basis of the program. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Pakistan People's Party Following his resignation as foreign minister, large crowds gathered to listen to Bhutto's speech upon his arrival in Lahore on 21 June 1967. Tapping a wave of anger against Ayub, Bhutto travelled across Pakistan to deliver political speeches. In October 1966 Bhutto made explicit the beliefs of his new party. Islam is our faith, democracy is our policy, socialism is our economy. All power to the people. On 30 November 1967, at the Lahore residence of Mubashir Hassan, a gathering that included Bhutto, Bengali communist J. A. Rahim and Basit Jahangir Sheikh founded the Pakistan People's Party PPP, establishing a strong base in Punjab, Sindh and amongst the Muhahirs. Hassan, an engineering professor at UET Lahore, was the main brain and hidden hand behind the success and the rise of Bhutto. Under Hassan's guidance and Bhutto's leadership, the PPP became a part of the pro-democracy movement involving diverse political parties from all across Pakistan. 
The PPP activists staged large protests and strikes in different parts of the country, increasing pressure on Ayub to resign. Dr. Hassan and Bhutto's arrest on 12 November 1969, sparked greater political unrest. After his release, Bhutto, joined by key leaders of PPP, attended the round table conference called by Ayub Khan in Rawalpindi, but refused to accept Ayub's continuation in office and the East Pakistani politician Sheikh Mujibur Rahman's six point movement for regional autonomy. Following Ayub's resignation, his successor, General Yahya Khan, promised to hold parliamentary elections on 7 December 1970. Bhutto attracted the leftist and ultra-leftist forces, who gathered under his leadership, becoming the full sum of force. The socialist-communist mass, under Bhutto's leadership, intensified its support in Muhahir and poor farming communities in West Pakistan, working through educating people to cast their vote for their better future. Gathering and uniting the scattered socialist Marxist mass in one single center was considered Bhutto's greatest political achievements and as its result, the leftist and Bhutto's party won a large number of seats from constituencies in West Pakistan. However, Sheikh Mujib's Awami League won an absolute majority in the legislature, receiving more than twice as many votes as Bhutto's PPP. Bhutto refused to accept an Awami League government and famously promised to break the legs of any elected PPP member who dared to attend the inaugural session of the National Assembly. Capitalizing on West Pakistani fears of East Pakistani separatism, Bhutto demanded that Sheikh Mujib form a coalition with the PPP. Amidst popular outrage in East Pakistan, Sheikh Mujib declared the independence of Bangladesh, according to historical references and a report published by leading newspaper. Mujib no longer believed in Pakistan and was determined to make Bangladesh. As long as she is the Prime Minister, relations between Bangladesh and Pakistan cannot normalize, the nation noted. On 26 March 1971 Mujib was arrested by the Pakistan Army, which had been ordered by Yahya to suppress political activities. While supportive of the army's actions and working to rally international support, Bhutto distanced himself from the Yahya regime and began to criticize Khan for mishandling the situation. He refused to accept Yahya's scheme to appoint Bengali politician Nurul Amin as prime minister, with Bhutto as deputy prime minister. Soon after his refusal and continuous resentment toward General Yahya Khan's mishandling of situation, General Yahya Khan ordered military police to arrest Bhutto for a treason charges, a quiet similar to Mujib. Bhutto was situated at the Adiala jail along with Mujib, where he was set to face the charges. The Indian intervention in East Pakistan led to the very bitter defeat of Pakistani forces, who surrendered on 16 December 1971. Bhutto and others condemned Yahya for failing to protect Pakistan's unity. Isolated, Yahya resigned on 20 December and transferred power to Bhutto, who became president, commander in chief, and the first civilian chief martial law administrator. Bhutto was the country's first civilian chief martial law administrator since 1958, as well as the country's first civilian president. With Bhutto assuming the control, the leftists and democratic socialists entered the country's politics, and later emerged as power players in the country's politics. And, for the first time in the country's history, the leftists and democratic socialists had a chance to administer the country with the popular vote and widely approved exclusive mandate, given to them by the West's population in the 1970s elections, in a reference written by Kuldeep Nair in his book, Scoop, Inside Stories from the Partition to the Present. Nayer noted that, Bhutto's releasing of Mujib did not mean anything to Pakistan's policy as in if there was no liberation war. Bhutto's policy, and even as of today, the policy of Pakistan continues to state that she will continue to fight for the honor and integrity of Pakistan. East Pakistan is an inseparable and unseverable part of Pakistan. President of Pakistan A Pakistan International Airlines flight was sent to fetch Bhutto from New York, who at that time was presenting Pakistan's case before the United Nations Security Council on the East Pakistan Crises. Bhutto returned home on 18 December 1971. On 20 December, he was taken to the President House in Rawalpindi, where he took over two positions from Yahya Khan, one as President and the other as First Civilian Chief Martial Law Administrator. Thus, he was the first civilian chief martial law administrator of the dismembered Pakistan. 
By the time Bhutto had assumed control of what remained of Pakistan, the nation was completely isolated, angered, and demoralized. As president, Bhutto faced mounting challenges on both internal and foreign fronts. The trauma was severe in Pakistan, a psychological setback and emotional breakdown for Pakistan. The two-nation theory, the theoretical basis for the creation of Pakistan, lay discredited, and Pakistan's foreign policy collapsed when no moral support was found anywhere, including long-standing allies such as the US and China. Since her creation, the physical and moral existence of Pakistan was in great danger. On the internal front, Baloch, Sindhi and Pashtun nationalisms were at their peak, calling for their independence from Pakistan. Finding it difficult to keep Pakistan united, Bhutto launched full-fledged intelligence and military operations to stamp out any separatist movements. By the end of 1978, these nationalist organizations were brutally quelled by Pakistan armed forces. Bhutto immediately placed Yahya Khan under house arrest, brokered a ceasefire, and ordered the release of Sheikh Mujib, who was held prisoner by the Pakistan army. To implement this, Bhutto reversed the verdict of Mujib's earlier court martial trial, in which Brigadier General Rahimuddin Khan had sentenced Mujib to death. Appointing a new cabinet, Bhutto appointed Lieutenant General Gul Hassan as Chief of Army Staff. On 2 January 1972 Bhutto announced the nationalization of all major industries, including iron and steel, heavy engineering, heavy electricals, petrochemicals, cement and public utilities. A new labor policy was announced increasing workers' rights and the power of trade unions. Although he came from a feudal background himself, Bhutto announced reforms limiting land ownership and a government takeover of over a million acres to distribute to landless peasants. More than 2,000 civil servants were dismissed on charges of corruption. Bhutto also dismissed the military chiefs on 3 March after they refused orders to suppress a major police strike in Punjab. He appointed General Tikka Khan as the new chief of the army staff in March 1972 as he felt the general would not interfere in political matters and would concentrate on rehabilitating the Pakistan army. Bhutto convened the National Assembly on 14 April, rescinded martial law on 21 April and charged the legislators with writing a new constitution. Bhutto visited India to meet Prime Minister Indira Gandhi and negotiated a formal peace agreement and the release of 93,000 Pakistani prisoners of war. The two leaders signed the Simla Agreement, which committed both nations to establish a new yet temporary line of control in Kashmir and obligated them to resolve disputes peacefully through bilateral talks. Bhutto also promised to hold a future summit for the peaceful resolution of the Kashmir dispute and pledged to recognize Bangladesh. Although he secured the release of Pakistani soldiers held by India, Bhutto was criticized by many in Pakistan for allegedly making too many concessions to India. It is theorized that Bhutto feared his downfall if he could not secure the release of Pakistani soldiers and the return of territory occupied by Indian forces. Bhutto established an atomic power development program and inaugurated the first Pakistani atomic reactor, built in collaboration with Canada in Karachi on 28 November. On 30 March 59 military officers were arrested by army troops for allegedly plotting a coup against Bhutto, who appointed then Brigadier Muhammad Zia-ul-Haq to head a military tribunal to investigate and try the suspects. The National Assembly approved the new 1973 constitution, which Bhutto signed into effect on 12 April. The constitution proclaimed an ''Islamic Republic'' in Pakistan with a parliamentary form of government. On 10 August, Bhutto turned over the post of president to Fazal Alai Chaudhry, assuming the office of prime minister instead. Nuclear weapons program Dufakar Ali Bhutto was the founder of Pakistan's atomic bomb program, and due to his administrative and aggressive leadership to lead this nuclear deterrence program, Bhutto is often known as father of nuclear deterrence program. Bhutto's interest in nuclear technology was said to have begun during his college years in the United States when Bhutto attended a course in political science, discussing political impact of U.S.'s first nuclear test, Trinity, on global politics. While at Berkeley, Bhutto witnessed the public panic when the Soviet Union first exploded the bomb, codename First Lightning in 1949, prompting the U.S. government to famously launch the research on hydrogen bombs. 
However, in 1958 when long before as Minister for Fuel, Power, and National Resources, Bhutto played a key role in setting up the Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission administrative research bodies and institutes. Soon, Bhutto offered a technical post to Munir Ahmad Khan in PAEC in 1958, and lobbied for Abdus Salam as being appointed as science advisor in 1960. Before being elevated as foreign minister, Bhutto directed the funds for key research in nuclear weapons and related science. In October 1965, as foreign minister, Dufakar Ali Bhutto visited Vienna, where nuclear engineer Munir Ahmad Khan, working at a senior technical post at the IAEA, informed him of the status of Indian nuclear program and the options Pakistan had to develop its own nuclear capability. Both agreed on the need for Pakistan to develop a nuclear deterrent to meet India's nuclear capacity. While, Munir Ahmad Khan had failed to convince Ayub Khan, Bhutto had said to Munir Ahmad Khan, don't worry, our turn will come. Shortly, after the 1965 war, Bhutto in a press conference, famously declared that, even if we have to eat grass, we will make nuclear bomb. We have no other choice. As he saw India was making its way to develop the bomb. In 1965, Bhutto lobbied for Salam and succeeded to appoint Salam as the head of Pakistan's delegation at IAEA, and helped Salam to lobby for acquiring of the nuclear power plants. In November 1972, Bhutto advised Salam to travel to United States to evade the war, and advised him to return with the key literature on nuclear history. By the end week of December 1972, Salam returned to Pakistan, loaded with literature on the Manhattan Project, in his huge suitcases. In 1974, Bhutto launched a more aggressive and serious diplomatic offensive on the United States and the Western world over the nuclear issues. Writing to the world and Western leaders, Bhutto made it clear and maintained, Pakistan was exposed to a kind of nuclear threat and blackmail, unparalleled elsewhere. If the world's community failed to provide political insurance to Pakistan and other countries against the nuclear blackmail, these countries would be constrained to launch atomic bomb programs of their own. Assurances provided by the United Nations were not enough. Shortly, roughly two weeks passed after experiencing the 1971 Winter War, on 20 January 1972, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto rallied a conference of nuclear scientists and engineers at Moulton. While at the Moulton meeting, arranged by Bhutto's science advisor Abdus Salam, scientists were wondering why the president who had so much on his hands in those trying days was paying so much attention to the scientists and engineers in the nuclear field. At the meeting Bhutto slowly talked about the recent war and country's future, pointing out the existence of the country was in great moral danger. While the academicians listened to Bhutto carefully, Bhutto said, Look, we're going to have the bomb. Bhutto asked them, Can you give it to me? And how long will it take it to make a bomb? Many of senior scientists had witnessed the war, and were emotionally and psychologically disturbed, therefore, the response was positive when the senior academic scientists replied, Oh? Yes. Yes. You can have it. There was a lively debate on the time needed to make the bomb, and finally one scientist dared to say that maybe it could be done in five years. Prime Minister Bhutto smiled, lifted his hand, and dramatically thrust forward three fingers and said, Three years, I want it in three years. The atmosphere suddenly became electric. It was then that one of the junior scientists Sadiq Ahmad Butt, a theoretical physicist, who under Munir Ahmad Khan's guiding hand would come to play a major role in making the fission weapon possible, jumped to his feet and clamored for his leader's attention. Sadiq Ahmad Butt replied, It can be done in three years. When Bhutto heard Butt's reply, Bhutto was very much amused and said, Well, much as I appreciate your enthusiasm, this is a very serious political decision, which Pakistan must make, and perhaps all third world countries must make one day, because it is coming. So can you boys do it? Nearly all senior scientists replied in one tone, Yes. We can do it, given the resources and given the facilities. Quote dot. Bhutto ended the meeting by simply saying, I shall find you the resources and I shall find you the facilities. Before the 1970s, the nuclear deterrence was long established under the government of Surawardi, but was completely peaceful and devoted for civil power. Bhutto, in his book The Myth of Independence in 1969, wrote that 
If Pakistan restricts or suspends her nuclear deterrence, it would not only enable India to blackmail Pakistan with her nuclear advantage, but would impose a crippling limitation on the development of Pakistan's science and technology. Our problem in its essence, is how to obtain such a weapon in time before the crisis begin. After India's nuclear test, codename Smiling Buddha, in May 1974, Bhutto sensed and saw this test as final anticipation for Pakistan's death. In a press conference, held shortly after India's nuclear test, Bhutto said, India's nuclear program is designed to intimidate Pakistan and establish hegemony in the subcontinent. Quote dot. Despite Pakistan limited financial resources, Bhutto was so enthusiastic about Pakistan nuclear energy project, that he is reported to have said, Pakistanis will eat grass but make a nuclear bomb. Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission's militarization was initiated on the 20th of January 1972 and in its initial years was implemented by Pakistan Army's Chief of Army Staff General Tikka Khan. The Karachi Nuclear Power Plant Kanipai was inaugurated by Bhutto during his role as President of Pakistan at the end of 1972. The nuclear weapons program was set up loosely based on Manhattan Project of the 1940s under the administrative control of Bhutto. And, senior academic scientists had a direct access to Bhutto, who kept him informed about every inch of the development. Bhutto's science advisor, Abdus Salam's office, was also set up in Bhutto's Prime Minister Secretariat. On Bhutto's request, Salam had established and led the Theoretical Physics Group TPG that marked the beginning of the nuclear deterrent program. The TPG designed and developed the nuclear weapons as well as the entire program. Later, Munir Ahmad Khan had him personally approved the budget for the development of the program, wanting a capable administrator. Bhutto sought Lieutenant General Rahimuddin Khan to chair the commission, which Rahimuddin declined, in 1971. Instead, in January 1972, Bhutto chose a U.S. trained nuclear engineer, Munir Ahmad Khan, as chairman of Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission PAEC, as Bhutto realized that he wanted an administrator who understood the scientific and economical needs of this such technologically giant and ambitious program. Since 1965, Khan had developed an extremely close and trusted relationship with Bhutto, and even after his death, Benazir and Mortaza Bhutto were instructed by their father to keep in touch with Munir Ahmad Khan. In spring of 1976, Kahuta Research Facility, then known as Engineering Research Laboratories Earl, as part of codename Project 706, was also established by Bhutto, and brought under nuclear scientist Abdul Qadir Khan and the Pakistan Army Corps of Engineers Lt. Gen. Zahid Ali Akbar, because Pakistan, under Bhutto, was not a signatory or party of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty NPT, the Nuclear Suppliers Group NSG, Commissariat of Lanergy Atomique C, and British Nuclear Fuels BNFL had immediately cancelled fuel reprocessing plant projects with PAEC. And, according to Khazar Nyazi, the Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission officials had misled Bhutto and he sought on a long journey to try to get nuclear fuel reprocessing plant from France. It was on the advice of AQ Khan that no fuel existed to reprocess and urged Bhutto to follow his pursuit of uranium enrichment. Bhutto tried to show he was still interested in that expensive route and was relieved when Kissinger persuaded the French to cancel the deal. Bhutto had trusted Munir Ahmad Khan's plans to develop the program ingeniously, and the mainstream goal of showing such interest in French reprocessing plant was to give time to PAEC scientists to gain expertise in building its own reprocessing plants. By the time Francis C. cancelled the project, the PAEC had acquired 95% of the detailed plans of the plant and materials. Munir Ahmad Khan and Ishfaq Ahmad believed that since PAEC had acquired most of the detailed plans, work, plans, and materials, the PAEC, based on that 95% work, could build the plutonium reprocessing reactors on its own. Pakistan should stick to its original plan, the plutonium route. Bhutto did not disagree but saw an advantage in establishing another parallel program, the Uranium Enrichment Program under Abdul Qadir Khan. Both Munir Khan and Ahmed had shown their concern over on Abdul Qadir Khan's suspected activities but Bhutto backed Khan when Bhutto maintained that, "...no less than any other nation did what Abdul Qadir Khan is doing, the Soviets and Chinese, the British and the French, the Indians and the Israelis, stole the nuclear weapons designs previously in the past and no one questioned them but rather tend to be quiet. 
we are not stealing what they illegally stole in the past as referring the nuclear weapon designs but we're taking a small machine which is not useful for making the atomic bomb but for a fuel International pressure was difficult to counter at that time, and Bhutto, with the help of Munir Ahmad Khan and Aziz Ahmed, tackled the intense heated criticism and diplomatic war with the United States at numerous fronts—while the progress on nuclear weapons remained highly classified. During this pressure, Aziz Ahmed played a significant role by convincing the consortium industries to sell and export sensitive electronic components before the United States could approach to them and try and prevent the consortium industries to export such equipments and components. Bhutto slowly reversed and thwarted United States any attempt to infiltrate the program as he had expelled many of the American diplomatic officials in the country, under Operation Sunrise, authorized by Bhutto under ISI. On the other hand, Bhutto intensified his staunch support and I blindly backed Abdul Qadir Khan to quietly bring the Urenko's weapon-grade technology to Pakistan, keeping the Kahuta laboratories hidden from the outside world. Regional rivals such as India and Soviet Union, had no basic intelligence on Pakistan's nuclear energy project during the 1970s, and Bhutto's intensified clandestine efforts seemed to be paid off in 1978 when the program was fully matured. In a thesis written in The Myth of Independence, Bhutto argued that nuclear weapons would allow India to use its Air Force warplanes that with the use of small battlefield nuclear devices against the Pakistan Army cantonments, armoured and infantry columns and PAF bases and nuclear and military industrial facilities. The Indian Air Force would not meet with an adverse reaction from the world community as long as civilian casualties could be kept to a minimum. This way, India would defeat Pakistan, force its armed forces into a humiliating surrender and occupy and annex the northern areas of Pakistan and Azad Kashmir. India would then carve up Pakistan into tiny states based on ethnic divisions and that would be the end of the Pakistan problem. Once and for all, by the time Bhutto was ousted, this crash program had fully matured in terms of technical development as well as scientific efforts. By the 1977, PAEC and KRL had built their uranium enrichment and plutonium reprocessing plants, and selection for test sites, at Chagai Hills, was done by the PAEC. The feasibility reports were submitted by both organizations on their works. In 1977, the PAEC's theoretical physics group had finished the designing of the first fission weapon, and KRL scientists succeeded in electromagnetic isotope separation of uranium fissile isotopes. In spite of this, still little had been done in the development of weapons, and Pakistan's nuclear arsenal were actually made by General Zia ul Haq's military regime, under the watchful eyes of several naval admirals, army, and air forces generals, including Ghulam Ishaq Khan. In 1983, Bhutto's decision later proved to be right, when PAEC had conducted a cold test, near Karana Hills, evidently made from non-fission plutonium. It has been speculated recently in the press that Dr. Khan's uranium enrichment designs were used by the Chinese in exchange for UF-6 and some highly enriched weapons-grade uranium. Later on this weapons-grade uranium was offered back to the Chinese as the Pakistanis used their own materials. In all, Bhutto knew that Pakistan had become a nuclear weapon state in 1978 when his friend Munir Ahmad Khan paid a visit to him in his jail cell. There, Munir Ahmad Khan told Bhutto that the process of weapon designing is finished and a milestone in the complex and difficult enrichment of weapon-grade fuel has been achieved by the PAEC and Dr. Abdul Qadir Khan of Earl. Bhutto called for an immediate nuclear test to be conducted, no response was issued by General Zia or any member of his government. We Pakistan less than pre greater than slash pre greater than dot 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 know that Israel and South Africa have full nuclear capability. A Christian, Jewish and Hindu civilization have this nuclear capability. The Islamic civilization is without it, but the situation is about to change. Prime Minister of Pakistan Bhutto was sworn in as the Prime Minister of the country on 14 August 1973, after he had secured 108 votes in a house of 146 members. Fazal Alai Chaudhry was elected as the president under the new constitution. During his five years of government, the Bhutto government made extensive reforms at every level of government. 
Pakistan's capital and Western reforms that were begun and built in 1947 throughout the 1970s, were transformed and replaced with socialist system. His policies were seen people-friendly, but it did not produce long-lasting effects as the civil disorder against Bhutto began to take place in 1977. Topic: Constitutional reforms. Bhutto is considered the main architect of 1973 constitution as part of his vision to put Pakistan to road to parliamentary democracy. One of the major achievements in Bhutto's life was drafting of Pakistan's first ever consensus constitution to the country. Bhutto supervised the promulgation of 1973 constitution that triggered an unstoppable constitutional revolution through his politics wedded to the emancipation of the downtrodden masses, by first giving people a voice in the parliament, and introducing radical changes in the economic sphere for their benefit. During his period in office, the government carried out seven major amendments to the 1973 constitution. The First Amendment led to Pakistan's recognition of and diplomatic ties with Bangladesh. The Second Amendment in the Constitution declared the Ahmadis as non-Muslims, and defined the term non-Muslim. The rights of the detained were limited under the Third Amendment while the powers and jurisdiction of the courts for providing relief to political opponents were curtailed under the Fourth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment passed on 15 September 1976, focused on curtailing the power and jurisdiction of the judiciary. This amendment was highly criticized by lawyers and political leaders. The main provision of the Sixth Amendment extended the term of the Chief Justices of the Supreme Court and the High Courts beyond the age of retirement. This amendment was made in the Constitution to favor the then Chief Justice of the Supreme Court who was supposed to be a friend of Bhutto. <laughs> <laughs> Domestic reforms The Bhutto government carried out a number of reforms in the industrial sector. His reforms were twofold, nationalization, and the improvement of workers' rights. In the first phase, basic industries like steel, chemical and cement were nationalized. This was done in 1972. The next major step in nationalization took place on 1 January 1974, when Bhutto nationalized all banks. The last step in the series was the nationalization of all flour, rice and cotton mills throughout the country. This nationalization process was not as successful as Bhutto expected. Most of the nationalized units were small businesses that could not be described as industrial units, hence making no sense for the step that was taken. Consequently, a considerable number of small businessmen and traders were ruined, displaced or rendered unemployed. In the concluding analysis, nationalization caused colossal loss not only to the national treasury but also to the people of Pakistan. The Bhutto government established a large number of rural and urban schools, including around 6,500 elementary schools, 900 middle schools, 407 high schools, 51 intermediate colleges, and 21 junior colleges. Bhutto also abandoned the Western education system and most of the literature was sent back to Western world, instead his government encouraged the local academicians to publish books on their respected fields. Though the local books were made cheaper to the public, these reforms came with controversy. His government made Islamic and Pakistan studies compulsory in schools. Book banks were created in most institutions and over 400,000 copies of textbooks were supplied to students. Bhutto is credited for establishing the world class Quaid e Azam University and Allama Iqbal Open University in Islamabad in 1974, as well as establishing Gomal University Dara Ismail Khan in 1973. In his role as foreign minister, and in 1967 with the help of Abdus Salam, established the Institute of Theoretical Physics. As Prime Minister, Bhutto made revolutionary efforts to expand the web of education. Bhutto established the Allama Iqbal Medical College in 1975. In 1974, with the help of Abdus Salam, Bhutto gave authorization of the International Nathiagali Summer College on Contemporary Physics INSC at the Nathiagali and as even as of today, INSC conference is still held on Pakistan, where thousands of scientists from all over the world are delegated to Pakistan to interact with Pakistan's academic scientists. In 1976, Bhutto established the Engineering Council, Institute of Theoretical Physics, Pakistan Academy of Letters and Cadet College Razmak in North Waziristan. 
A further four new universities which have been established at Moulton, Bahawalpur, and Kharpur. The People's Open University is another innovative venture which has started functioning from Islamabad. The government's education policy provides for the remission of fees and the grant of a number of scholarships for higher education to the children of low paid employees. 7,000 new hostel seats were planned to be added to the existing accommodation after the 1977 election. Bhutto said in 1975 he was aware of the difficulties and deficiencies faced by college students in many of the existing hostels. Directions have, therefore, been issued that fans, water coolers and pay telephones must be provided in each and every hostel in as short a time as physically possible. <laughs> Land, flood and agriculture reforms During his period as Prime Minister, a number of land reforms were also introduced. The important land reforms included the reduction of land ceilings and introducing the security of tenancy to tenant farmers. The land ceiling was fixed to 150 acres (0.61 square kilometers) of irrigated land and 300 acres (1.2 square kilometers) of non-irrigated land. Another step that Bhutto took was to democratize Pakistan's civil service. In Baluchistan, the pernicious practice of shishak and sardari system was abolished. In 1976, the Bhutto government carried out the establishment of Federal Flood Commission FFC, and was tasked to prepare national flood protection plans, and flood forecasting and research to harness floodwater. Bhutto later went on to upgrade a number of dams and barrages built in Sindh province. Bhutto was a strong advocate of empowering small farmers. He argued that if farmers were weak and demoralized then Pakistan's agricultural strength would be fragile, believing that farmers would not feel psychologically safe unless the country achieved self-sufficiency in food. Therefore, the Bhutto government launched programs to put the country on road to self-sufficiency in rice hulling, sugar milling and wheat husking industries. Bhutto's government intensified the control of rice hulling, sugar and wheat husking factories, initially believing that public sector involvement would reduce the influence of multinational corporations creating monopolies. The government initiated schemes for combating water logging and salinity. Tax exceptions were also introduced for small landowners to encourage the growth of agriculture. His nationalization of Sindh-based industries heavily benefited the poor, but badly upset the influential feudal lords. Topic. Economic policy Bhutto introduced socialist economics policies while working to prevent any further division of the country. Major heavy mechanical, chemical, and electrical engineering industries were immediately nationalized by Bhutto, and all of the industries came under direct control of government. Industries, such as KESC were under complete government control with no private influence in KESC decision. Bhutto abandoned Ayub Khan's state capitalism policies, and introduced socialist policies in a move to reduce the rich get richer and poor get poorer ratio. Bhutto also established the Port Qasim, Pakistan Steel Mills, the Heavy Mechanical Complex HMC, and several cement factories. However, the growth rate of economy relative to that of the 1960s when East Pakistan was still part of Pakistan and large generous aid from the United States declined, after the global oil crises in 1973, which also had a negative impact on the economy. Despite the initiatives undertaken by Bhutto's government to boost the country's economy, the economical growth remained at equilibrium level. But Bhutto's policy largely benefited the poor and working class when the level of absolute poverty was sharply reduced, with the percentage of the population estimated to be living in absolute poverty falling from 46.50% by the end of 1979-80, under the general Zia-ul-Haq's military rule, to 30.78%. The land reform program provided increased economic support to landless tenants, and development spending was substantially increased, particularly on health and education, in both rural and urban areas, and provided material support to rural wage workers, landless peasants, and urban wage workers. Bhutto's nationalization policies were initiated with an aim to put workers in control of the tools of production and to protect workers and small businesses. However, economical historians argued that the nationalization program initially affected the small industries and had devastating effects on Pakistan's economy shrunk Bhutto's credibility. 
Conservative critics believed the nationalization policies had damaged investors' confidence and government corruption in nationalized industries grew, although no serious corruption cases were ever proved against Bhutto by the military junta. In 1974, Bhutto maintained that foreign companies and industries in Pakistan were exempt from nationalization policies and his government would be willing to receive foreign investment to put up factories. While commenting on his policies in 1973, Bhutto told the group of investors that belonged to the Lahore Chamber of Commerce and Industry that, "...activity of public sector or state sector prevents the concentration of economic power in few hands, and protects the small and medium entrepreneurs from the clutches of giant enterprises and vested interests." Bhutto's shift away from some socialist policies badly upset his Democratic Socialist Alliance and many in the Pakistan People's Party. Many of his colleagues, most notable Malik Miraj, left Bhutto and departed to Soviet Union after resigning from law minister. Continuous disagreement led the government's Socialist Alliance to collapse, and further uniting with secular independence movement led by Ashgar Khan. As part of his investment policies, Bhutto founded the National Development Finance Corporation. NDFC. In July 1973, this financial institute began operation with an initial government investment of 100 million PRs. Its aim was finance public sector industrial enterprises but, later on, its charter was modified to provide finance to the private sector as well. The NDFC is currently the largest development finance institution of Pakistan performing diversified activities in the field of industrial financing and investment banking. 42 projects financed by NDFC have contributed 10,761 million rupees to Pakistan's GDP and generated Rs. 690 million after tax profits and 40,465 jobs. By the mid-1990s NDFC had a pool of resources amounting to US$878 million the Bhutto government increased the level of investment, private and public, in the economy from less than 7,000 million rupees in 1971-72 to more than 17,000 million rupees in 1974-75. Banking and export expansion Banking reforms were introduced to provide more opportunities to small farmers and business such as forcing banks to ensure 70% of institutional lending should be for small landholders of 12.5 acres or less, which was a revolutionary idea at a time when banks' only clients were the privileged classes. The number of bank branches rose by 75% from December 1971 to November 1976, from 3,295 to 5,727. It was one of the most radical move made by Bhutto, and the bank infrastructure was expanded covering all towns and villages with a population of 5,000 in accordance with targets set after the nationalization of banks. By end of the Bhutto government concentration of wealth had declined compared to height of the Ayub Khan era when 22 families owned 66% of industrial capital, and also controlled banking and 97% of insurance. Measures taken in the first few months of 1972 set a new framework for the revival of the economy. The diversion of trade from East Pakistan to international markets was completed within a short period. By 1974, exports exceeded $1 billion, showing a 60% increase over the combined exports of East and West Pakistan before separation. It was achieved and benefited with world was in the midst of the major 1973 oil crisis and in the middle of global recession. The national income of Pakistan increased by 15% and industrial production by as much as 20% in four years. Baluchistan Military operation Following the secession of East Pakistan, calls for the independence of Baluchistan by Baloch nationalists grew immensely. Surveying the political instability, Bhutto's central government sacked two provincial governments within six months, arrested the two chief ministers, two governors and 44 MNAs and MPAs, obtained an order from the Supreme Court banning the National People's Party on the recommendation of Akbar Bugti, and charged everyone with high treason to be tried by a specially constituted Hyderabad Tribunal of Hand-Picked Judges. 
In January 1973, Bhutto ordered the Pakistan Armed Forces to suppress a rising insurgency in the province of Baluchistan. He dismissed the governments in Baluchistan and the northwest frontier province once more. Following the alleged discovery of Iraqi arms in Islamabad in February 1973, Bhutto dissolved the Provincial Assembly of Baluchistan. The operation, under General Tikka Khan, soon took shape in a five-year conflict with the Baloch separatists. The sporadic fighting between the insurgency and the army started in 1973 with the largest confrontation taking place in September 1974. Later on, Pakistan Navy, under Vice Admiral Patrick Julius Simpson, also jumped in the conflict as it had applied naval blockades to Balochistan's port. The Navy began its separate operations to seize the shipments sent to aid Baloch separatists. Pakistan Air Force also launched air operations, and with the support of Navy and Army, the Air Force had pounded the mountainous hidden heavens of the separatists. The Iranian military, also fearing a spread of the greater Baloch resistance in Iran, aided the Pakistani military as well. Among Iran's contribution were 30 Huey Cobra attack helicopters and $200 million in aid. Topic: <inaudible> Iraqi intervention. Iraq under Sunni President Saddam Hussein sent Iraqi-made weapons to Pakistan's warm water ports. Pakistan's navy mounted an effective blockade. Saddam's government provided support for Baluchi separatists in Pakistan, hoping their conflict would spread to rival Iran. In 1973, Iraq provided the Baluchis with conventional arms, and it opened an office for the Baluchistan Liberation Front BLF in Baghdad. This operation was supposed to be covert, but in 1973, the operation was exposed by MI when senior separatist leader Akbar Bugti defected to Bhutto, revealing a series of arms stored in the Iraqi embassy. On the midnight of 9 February 1973, Bhutto launched an operation to seize control of the Iraqi embassy, and preparation for siege was hastily prepared. The operation was highly risky and a wrong step could have started a war between the two countries. The operation was carefully analyzed and at 0 hundred hours 12 a.m., the SSG division accompanied by army rangers stormed the embassy. Military police arrested the Iraqi ambassador, the military attaché, and Iraq's diplomatic staff. Following the incident, authorities discovered 300 Soviet sub-machine guns with 50,000 rounds of ammunition and a large amount of money that was to be distributed amongst Baluchi separatist groups. Bhutto was angered and frustrated. Without demanding an explanation, he ordered the military police to immediately expel the Iraqi ambassador and his staff as persona non grata on the first available flight. The government announced the Iraqi plan to further dismember the country, and Bhutto's successful diplomatic offensive against Iraq isolated Saddam internationally with global condemnation. This incident caused Pakistan to support Iran during the Iran Iraq War in the 1980s and the U.S. invasion of Iraq against Saddam Hussein in 2003. Topic. Aftermath In order to avoid a replay of the East Pakistan War, Bhutto launched economic and political reforms in the midst of the conflict. Bhutto government abolished the feudal system, the feudal lords continued to appropriate to themselves a generous share of government developmental funds whilst at the same time, they opposed and blackmailed the government whenever they could. Gradually the tribesmen started coming out of the Sardar's quarantine. Modern amenities, for instance medical aid, automobiles for passenger transport and schooling of children became available in the interior of Baluchistan for the first time, since 1947. The Bhutto government also constructed 564 miles of new roads, including the key link between Sibi and Maiwand creating new trade and commerce centers. <laughs> Passport reforms. Bhutto government gave the right of a passport to every citizen of Pakistan and facilitated millions of skilled and non-skilled Pakistanis to seek employment in the Middle Eastern countries through assigning a number combination of bilateral agreements. From Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, alone 35,000 workers were given the opportunity to work in the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. Bhutto used the Pakistani community of London to lobby and influence European governments to improve the rights of expatriate Pakistani communities in Europe. 
The remittances from overseas Pakistanis, which now total around $25 billion per annum, constitute a dependable source of foreign exchange for Pakistan. Labor policy and social security The labor policy was among one of the most important cornerstone of Bhutto's government and a comprehensive labor reforms initiated by the Bhutto government. Shortly after assuming control, Bhutto's government imposed some conditions on the dismissal of workers. In 1973, the government instituted labor courts for the speedy redress of workers' grievances and the government also introduced a scheme for workers' participation in management, through the nationalization policy. This scheme provided for 20% participation by workers in management committees set up at factory level. The government abolished the workers' contribution to the Social Security Fund, instead, the employers were made to increase their contribution from 4 to 6%. The government enhanced compensation rates under the Workers' Compensation Act. In 1972, the Bhutto government initially provided for some old age benefits for workers through group insurance, increased rates of compensation, and higher rates of gratuity. However, the policy did not benefit it immediately, therefore, the government introduced a pension scheme of old age benefits which would provide a payment of 75 rupees a month to workers after retirement at the age of 55 for men and 50 for women, on condition that the worker had completed a minimum of 15 years insurable employment. This applied to all factories, industries, and establishments employing 10 or more workers drawing monthly wages up to 1,000 rupees. Skilled workers who become invalid after five years of insurable employment were also made entitled to benefits under this scheme. Bhutto did not want to go for the Western model where workers generally contribute along with the employers towards their old age benefits. In view of Pakistan's conditions, Bhutto's government did not wish the financial burden of this scheme to fall even partly on the worker. It was decided that the scheme be founded through a contribution from employers to the extent of 5% of the wage bill. Foreign policy After assuming power, Bhutto sought to diversify Pakistan's relations away from the United States and, soon Pakistan left Chento and Sito. Bhutto developed close and strengthened the Arab relations, and Sino-Pak relations. Bhutto in believed an independent foreign policy which had hitherto been the handmaiden of the Western power, particularly independent from the United States' sphere of influence. With Bhutto as foreign minister, and prime minister, Pakistan and Iran had cemented a special relationship, as Iran had provided military assistance to Pakistan. The Sino-Pak relations were immensely improved, and Pakistan, under Bhutto, had built a strategic relationship with People's Republic of China, when PRC was isolated. In 1974, Bhutto hosted the Second Organization of the Islamic Conference in 1974 where he delegated and invited leaders from the Muslim world to Lahore, Punjab province of Pakistan. Bhutto was a strong advocate of Afro-Asian solidarity and had cemented ties with Afro-Asian and Islamic countries and by 1976 had emerged as the leader of the Third World. Bhutto sought a peace agreement. Simla agreement with Indira Gandhi, Premier of India, and brought back 93,000 POWs to Pakistan and secured 5,000 square miles 13,000 square kilometers held by India without compromising on Kashmir stance or recognizing Bangladesh which were the key Indian demands. Negotiating with a power that has dismembered the country was an open challenge to Bhutto who smoothly convinced India to return the territory and the POWs back to Pakistan. Before this conference, Bhutto and his colleagues did the comprehensive homework as Bhutto had realized that Arabs had still not succeeded in regaining territory lost in the 1967 war with Israel. Therefore, capturing of land does not cry out for international attention the same way as the prisoners do. According to Benazir Bhutto, Bhutto demanded the control of the territory in the first stage of the agreement which surprised and shocked the Indian delegation. In Bhutto's point of view, the POW problem was more of a humanitarian problem that could be tackled at any time, but the territorial problem was something that could be integrated in India as time elapses. Indian Premier Gandhi was stunned and astonished at Bhutto's demand and reacted immediately by refusing Bhutto's demand. However, Bhutto calmed her and negotiated with economic packages dealt with Gandhi. 
Bhutto's knowledge and his intellectualism impressed Gandhi personally that Gandhi agreed to give the territory back to Bhutto in a first stage of the agreement. Signing of this agreement with Pakistan paying small price is still considered Bhutto's one of the huge diplomatic success, his vast knowledge, intelligence, and keen awareness of post-World War II, and the nuclear history, enabled him to craft the foreign policy which brought unmatched undivideds in Pakistan's foreign policy history. Elements of his policy were continued by the successive governments to play a vital role in world's politics. In 1974, Bhutto and his foreign minister Aziz Ahmed brought a UN resolution, recommending and calling for the establishment of nuclear weapon-free zone in South Asia, whilst he and Aziz Ahmed aggressively attacked the Indian nuclear program. While Abdul Qadir Khan was tasked with bringing the gas centrifuge technology through the means of atomic proliferation, the goal of the resolution was achieved when Bhutto put India on the defensive position and promoted Pakistan as a non-proliferationist. East Asia Since the 1960s, Bhutto had been an anti-Sito and preferred a non-aligned policy. Soon after assuming the office, Bhutto took a lengthy foreign trip to Southeast Asia, seeking closer and tighter relations with Vietnam, Thailand, Laos, Burma, and North Korea. His policy largely followed a tight and closer relations with China, normalized relationships with Soviet Union, built an Islamic bloc, and advocated a creation of new economical alliance largely benefiting the third and second world countries. All of these initiations and implications had disastrous effects on Japan, prompting Japan to oppose Bhutto, although Bhutto was a great admirer of Japan even though Japan was not a constituent part of Bhutto's foreign policy. In the 1970s, Japan made several attempts to get close to Bhutto, sending its military officials, scientists, and parliamentary delegations to Pakistan. Hence Japan went far by condemning India for carrying out a nuclear test, smiling Bhutto, in 1974, and publicly supported Pakistan's non-nuclear weapon policy and pledged to build several new nuclear power plants. In 1970, Bhutto advised Japan not to be party of NPT, but Japan signed it but later regretted for not being properly progressed. In Bhutto's view, Japan had been under the United States' influence, and much bigger role of Japan in Asia would only benefit American interests in the region. By the 1970s, Japan completely lost its momentum in Pakistan as Pakistan followed a strict independent policy. Bhutto envisioned Pakistan's new policy as benefiting the economic relations rather than the military alliance which also affected Japan's impact on Pakistan. However, much of the foreign policy efforts were reverted by General Zia-ul-Haq and ties were finally restored after Bhutto's execution. <inaudible> <inaudible> Arab world and Israel Bhutto sought to improve Pakistan's ties with the Arab world, and sided with the Arab world during the Arab-Israeli conflict. Colonel Gaddafi of former socialist Libya considered Bhutto as one of his greatest inspirations and was said to be very fond of Bhutto's intellectualism. In 1973, during the Yom Kippur War, Pakistan's relations with the Arab world represented a watershed. In both Pakistan and the Arab world, Pakistan's swift, unconditional and forthright offer of assistance to the Arab states was deeply appreciated. In 1974, pressured by other Muslim nations, Pakistan eventually recognized Bangladesh as Mujib stated he would only go to the OIC conference in Lahore if Pakistan recognized Bangladesh. Pakistan established full diplomatic relations with Bangladesh on 18 January 1976 and relations improved in the following decades. Bhutto aided the Syrian and Egyptian Air Force by sending the Pakistan Air Force and Navy's top fighter pilots where they flew combat missions against Israel. However, Iraq was not benefited with Bhutto policies. In early 1977, Bhutto decided to use ISI to provide the credible intelligence on Iraqi nuclear program that Pakistan and the ISI had secretly gained. The government passed intel that identified Iraqi nuclear program and the OSIRAC nuclear reactor at OSIRAC to Israel's Mossad. Helping Israel to infiltrate Iraqi nuclear program was also continued by General Zia-ul-Haq as their policy to teach Iraq and Saddam Hussein a lesson for supporting the Baloch liberation fronts and movements. United States and Soviet Union 
In 1974, India carried out a nuclear test, codenamed Smiling Buddha, near Pakistan's eastern border. Bhutto unsuccessfully lobbied for the United States to impose economic sanctions on India. However, at the request of Bhutto, Pakistan's ambassador to the United States convened a meeting with Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. Kissinger told Pakistan's ambassador to Washington that the test is a fait accompli and that Pakistan would have to learn to live with it. Although he was aware this was a little rough on the Pakistanis. In 1976, the ties were further severed with Bhutto as Bhutto had continued to administer the research on weapons, and in 1976, in a meeting with Bhutto and Kissinger, Kissinger had told to Bhutto, that if you Bhutto do not cancel, modify or postpone the reprocessing plant agreement, we will make a horrible example from you. The meeting was ended by Bhutto as he had replied, For my country's sake, for the sake of people of Pakistan, I did not succumb to that blackmailing and threats. After this meeting, Bhutto intensified Pakistan's foreign policy towards more onto movement of non aligned countries, and sought to develop relations with both Soviet Union and the United States. Bhutto was keenly aware of Great Britain's policy of divide and rule, and American policy of unite and rule. In 1974, Bhutto, as Prime Minister, visited Soviet Union. Prime Minister Bhutto deliberately undertook to improve relations with the Soviet Union and the Communist bloc. Bhutto sought to develop and alleviated the Soviet-Pakistani relations, with Soviet Union established Pakistan steel mills in 1972. The foundation stone for this gigantic project was laid on 30 December 1973 by Bhutto. Facing inexperience for the erection work of the integrated steel mill, Bhutto requested Soviet Union to send its experts. Soviet Union sends dozens of advisors and experts, under Russian scientist Mikhail Koltakov, who supervised the construction of this integrated steel mills, with a number of industrial and consortium companies financing this mega project. The relationship with United States was at low point and severed as United States was opposing Pakistan's nuclear deterrence program. Although, Richard Nixon enjoyed firmly strong relations with Bhutto and was a close friend of Bhutto, the graph of relations significantly went down under the presidency of Jimmy Carter. Carter tightened the embargo placed on Pakistan and placed a pressure through the United States ambassador to Pakistan, Brigadier General Henry Byrode. The socialist orientation, and Bhutto's proposed left-wing theories, had badly upset the United States, further ringing bells of alarm in the United States as fearing Pakistan's loss as an ally in the Cold War. The leftists and Bhutto's policy towards Soviet Union was seen sympathetic and had built a bridge for Soviet Union to have gain access in Pakistan's warm water ports, that something both United States and Soviet Union had lacked. During the course of 1976 presidential election, Carter was elected as U.S. president, and his very inaugural speech Carter announced the determination to seek the ban of nuclear weapons. With Carter's election, Bhutto lost all links to United States administration he had through President Nixon. Bhutto had to face the embargo and pressure from the American president who was totally against the political objectives which Bhutto had set forth for his upcoming future plans. Carter indirectly announced his opposition to Bhutto, his ambition and the elections. Although, Carter placed an embargo on Pakistan, Bhutto under the technical guidance and diplomatic though Aziz Ahmed, succeeded to buy sensitive equipments, common metal materials, and electronic components, marked as common items. Hide the true nature of the intentions, greatly enhance the atomic bomb project, though a complete failure for Carter's embargo. In a thesis written by historian Abdul Ghaffar Bugari, Carter keenly sabotaged Bhutto credibility, but did not want it favored his execution as Carter made a call to General Zia ul Haq to stop the act. Therefore, senior leadership of Pakistan People's Party reached out to different countries' ambassadors and high commissioners but did not meet with the U.S. ambassador, as the leadership knew the noble part played by Carter and his administration. When Carter administration discovered Bhutto's act, the program was reached to a well-advanced level, and furthermore, had disastrous effect on Salt I Treaty which was soon collapse, a failure of President Carter to stop the atomic proliferation and arm race between Soviet Union and United States heightened. <laughs> Afghanistan and Central Asia In 1972, Bhutto initially tried to build friendly ties with Afghanistan but such attempts were rebuffed in 1973. 
In 1974, Afghanistan began covert involvement in Pakistan's Khyber Pakhtunkhwa which became increasingly disturbing for Bhutto's government. Afghan President Dawood Khan's controversial Pashtunization policies resulted in Pakistan with gruesome violence and civil disturbances. The ISI quickly pointed out that President Dodd was providing safe havens and training camps to anti-Pakistan militants and its intelligence agency had been a main arm of supporting the actions inside Pakistan, including providing support to Baloch separatists. Therefore, Bhutto's government decided to retaliate, and Bhutto launched a covert counter-operation in 1974 under the command of Major General Nasirullah Babar, who was then Director General of the MI. Directorate General for Western Fronts DGWI. According to General Baber, it was an excellent idea and it had hard-hitting impact on Afghanistan. The aim of this operation was to arm the Islamic fundamentalists and to instigate an attack in different parts of Afghanistan. In 1974, Bhutto authorized a covert operation in Kabul and the Pakistan Air Force and the members of AI and the ISI successfully extradited Burhanuddin Rabbani, Jan Muhammad Khan, Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, and Ahmad Shah Massoud to Peshawar, amid fear that Rabbani may be assassinated. By the end of 1974, Bhutto gave final authorization of covert operation to train Afghan Mujahedin to take on Daud Khan's government. This operation was an ultimate success. By 1976, Dodd had become concerned about his country's over dependence on the Soviet Union and the rising insurgency. Thereon, on 7 June 1976, Bhutto paid a three day state visit to Afghanistan, followed by five day visit of Dodd Khan to Pakistan on August's last week of 1976. On 2 March 1977, an agreement on the resumption of air communications between Afghanistan and Pakistan was reached, as relations continued to improve. Bhutto and Dodd made an exchange of official visit to force Afghanistan to accept the Durand Line as the permanent border. However, these development were interrupted as Bhutto was removed and Dodd Khan was also overthrown in a military coup shortly after. Western experts viewed Bhutto's policy as astute policy. In regards to the border question clearly increased pressure of the Afghanistan and very likely helped stimulate Afghan government's move towards accommodation. Whilst the deputy Afghan foreign minister Abdul Samad Gauss also admitted before the compromise Afghanistan had been heavily involved inside Pakistan. Decline <inaudible> 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 Popular unrest Bhutto began facing considerable criticism and increasing in popularity as his term progressed. Initially targeting the opposition leader Abdul Wali Khan and his National Awami Party a democratic socialist party, the socialist and communist mass who gathered under Bhutto's leadership began to disintegrate, thus dividing and allying with secular fronts. Despite the ideological similarity of the two parties, clashes between them became increasingly fierce. This started with the federal government's ousting of the NAP provincial government in Baluchistan for alleged secessionist activities, and ended with the ban on the NAP. Subsequently, much of the NAP top leadership was arrested, after Bhutto's confidant Hyatt Sherpawi was killed in a Peshawar bomb blast. Another notable figure, Chief Justice Hamoudur Rahman died due to a cardiac arrest while in the office. Between the 1974 and 1976, many of Bhutto's original members had left Bhutto due to political differences or natural death causes. In 1974, Bhutto's trusted science advisor Abdus Salam also left Pakistan when parliament declared Ahmadiyya Muslims as non-Muslims. With Salam's departure, the research on nuclear weapons slowed down the progress as Dr. Mubashir Hassan, now Bhutto's appointed science advisor, would focus on politics more than the science research. Many civil bureaucrats and military officers loyal to Bhutto were replaced by new faces. Bhutto found himself with new advisors and collaborators. Dissidents also increased within the PPP, and the murder of dissident leader Ahmad Raza Kasari's father led to public outrage and intra party hostility as Bhutto was accused of masterminding the crime. Powerful PPP leaders such as Ghulam Mustafa Kar, former governor of Punjab, openly condemned Bhutto and called for protests against his regime. 
The political crisis in the northwest frontier province and Baluchistan intensified as civil liberties remained suspended and an estimated 100,000 troops deployed there were accused of human rights abuses and killing large numbers of civilians on the 8th of January 1977 the opposition organized into the Pakistan National Alliance PNA a nine-party coalition against the government of Bhutto and his allies Bhutto called fresh elections but the PNA did not obtain a clear majority the PNA faced defeat but did not accept the results, accusing their opponents of rigging the election. The dissidents ultimately claimed that 40 seats in the National Assembly were rigged, and boycotted the provincial elections. In the face of the resulting low voter turnout, the PNA declared the newly elected Bhutto government as illegitimate. Hard-line Islamist leaders such as Maulana Madhudi called for the overthrow of Bhutto's regime. Mubashir Hassan, science advisor of Bhutto, feared a possible coup against Bhutto. Hassan entered the dispute and made an unsuccessful attempt to reach an agreement with PNA. Most Islamists refused to meet with Hassan as they saw him as the architect of Bhutto's success. The same year, an intensive crackdown was initiated on the Pakistan Muslim League, a conservative front. The People's National Party's president and former leader of the opposition Khan Valley Khan saw Bhutto's actions as his last stand against PNA. The armed forces and Bhutto, including his colleagues, were isolated. In an open public seminar, Valley Khan quoted that, There is one possible grave for two people. Let us see who gets in first. The Federal Security Force allegedly either arrested or extrajudicially killed members of the Muslim League. Following this, amid protest and civil distress felt in Lahore, and People's Party lost the administrative control over the city. <laughs> <laughs> Military coup On 3 July 1977, then Major General K.M. Arif secretly met Bhutto, revealing that the planning of a coup had been taking place in the General Combatant Headquarters GHQ. At this secret meeting, General Arif encouraged Bhutto to rush the negotiation with the PNA, before it's too late. Intensifying political and civil disorder prompted Bhutto to hold talks with PNA leaders, which culminated in an agreement for the dissolution of the assemblies and fresh elections under a government of national unity. However, on 5 July 1977 Bhutto and members of his cabinet were arrested by troops under the order of General Zia. It is generally believed that the coup took place on the pretext of unrest despite Bhutto having reached an agreement with the opposition. Bhutto had good intelligence within the army, and officers such as Major General Tajamul Hussain Malik were loyal to him until the end. However, General Zia ul Haq ordered a training program with the officers from Special Air Service. SAS. General Zia ul Haq ordered many of Bhutto's loyal officers to attend the first course. However, classes for senior officers were delayed until the midnight. None of the officers were allowed to leave until late in the evening before the coup. During this time, arrangements for the coup was made. General Zia announced that martial law had been imposed, the constitution suspended and all assemblies dissolved and promised elections within 90 days. Zia also ordered the arrest of senior PPP and PNA leaders but promised elections in October. Bhutto was released on 29 July and was received by a large crowd of supporters in his hometown of Larkana. He immediately began touring across Pakistan, delivering speeches to very large crowds and planning his political comeback. Bhutto was arrested again on 3 September before being released on bail on 13 September. Fearing yet another arrest, Bhutto named his wife, Nusrat, president of the Pakistan People's Party. Bhutto was imprisoned on 16 September and a large number of PPP leaders, notably Dr. Mubashir Hassan and activists were arrested and disqualified from contesting the elections. Observers noted that when Bhutto was removed from power in July 1977, thousands of Pakistanis cheered and were delighted. <laughs> Arrests and trial On 5 July 1977 the military, led by General Muhammad Zia ul Haq, staged a coup. Zia relieved Prime Minister Bhutto of power, holding him in detention for a month. Zia pledged that new elections would be held in 90 days. 
He kept postponing the elections and publicly retorted during successive press conferences that if the elections were held in the presence of Bhutto his party would not return to power again. Upon his release, Bhutto travelled around the country amid adulatory crowds of PPP supporters. He used to take the train from the south to the north, and en route would address public meetings at different stations. Several of these trains were late, some by days, in reaching their respective destinations and as a result Bhutto was banned from travelling by train. The last visit he made to the city of Multan in the province of Punjab marked the turning point in Bhutto's political career and ultimately, his life. In spite of the administration's efforts to block the gathering, the crowd was so large that it became disorderly, providing an opportunity for the administration to declare that Bhutto, along with Dr. Hassan, had been taken into custody because the people were against him and it had become necessary to protect him from the masses for his own safety. On 3 September, the army arrested Bhutto again on charges of authorizing the murder of a political opponent in March 1974. A 35-year-old politician Ahmed Raza Kasuri and his family had been ambushed, leaving Kasuri's father, Nawab Muhammad Ahmad Khan Kasuri, dead. Kasuri claimed that he was the actual target, accusing Bhutto of orchestrating the attack. Kasuri later claimed that he had been the target of 15 assassination attempts. Bhutto's wife Nusrat Bhutto assembled a team of top Pakistani lawyers for Bhutto's defense, led by Fakhruddin G. Ibrahim, Yahya Bakhtiar and Abdul Hafiz Prasada. Bhutto was released ten days after his arrest after a judge, Justice K. M. A. Samdani, found the evidence to be contradictory and incomplete. As a result, Justice Samdani was immediately removed from the bench and placed at the disposal of the law ministry. Three days later Zia arrested Bhutto again on the same charges, this time under martial law. When the PPP organized demonstrations among Bhutto's supporters, Zia cancelled the upcoming elections. Bhutto was arraigned before the High Court of Lahore instead of in a lower court, thus depriving him of one level of appeal. The judge who had granted him bail had been removed. Five new judges were appointed, headed by Chief Justice of Lahore High Court Malvi Mushtaq Hussain. Hussain had previously served as Bhutto's foreign secretary in 1965, and was alleged to have strongly disliked and distrusted Bhutto. Hussain was a not only a Zia appointee but hailed from his home Jalandhar district. The trial lasted five months, and Bhutto appeared in court in a dock specially built for the trial. Proceedings began on 24 October 1977. Masood Mahmood, the Director General of the Federal Security Force since renamed the Federal Investigation Agency, testified against Bhutto. Mahmood had been arrested immediately after Zia's coup and had been imprisoned for two months prior to taking the stand. In his testimony, he claimed Bhutto had ordered Kasuri's assassination and that four members of the Federal Security Force had organized the ambush on Bhutto's orders. The four alleged assassins were arrested and later confessed. They were brought into court as co-accused, but one of them recanted his testimony, declaring that it had been extracted from him under torture. The following day, the witness was not present in court and the prosecution claimed that he had suddenly fallen ill. Bhutto's defense team fought the case efficiently and challenged the prosecution with evidence from an army logbook the prosecution had submitted. It showed that the jeep allegedly driven during the attack on Kasuri was not even in Lahore at the time. The prosecution had the logbook disregarded as incorrect. During the cross-examination by the defense of witnesses, the bench often interrupted questioning. The 706-page official transcript contained none of the objections or inconsistencies in the evidence pointed out by the defense. Former U.S. Attorney General Ramsey Clark called it a mock trial fought in a kangaroo court. Having witnessed the trial, Clark later wrote, The prosecution's case was based entirely on several witnesses who were detained until they confessed, who changed and expanded their confessions and testimony with each reiteration, who contradicted themselves and each other, who, except for Masood Mahmood, were relating what others said, whose testimony led to four different theories of what happened, absolutely uncorroborated by an eyewitness, direct evidence, or physical evidence. When Bhutto began his testimony on 25 January 1978, Chief Justice Malvi Mushtaq closed the courtroom to all observers. Bhutto responded by refusing to say any more. Bhutto demanded a retrial, accusing the Chief Justice of bias, after Mushtaq allegedly insulted Bhutto's home province. The court refused his demand. Topic. 
Death sentence and appeal On 18 March 1978, Bhutto was declared not guilty of murder, but was sentenced to death. On 12 March 1978, Bhutto's former legal minister, Abdul Hafiz Prasada petitioned the Supreme Court for the release of Bhutto's science advisor, Mubashir Hassan, and to review Bhutto's death sentence based on the split decision. The Supreme Court denied Hassan's release because he was held by military police, but the court agreed to hear the arguments. After 12 days of proceedings, the Supreme Court concluded that the President of Pakistan can change a death sentence into life imprisonment. Perzada filed an application to then Chief Martial Law Administrator. However, General Zia ul Haq did not act immediately and claimed that the application had gone missing. Emotionally shattered, Prasada informed Bhutto about the development and General Zia ul Haq's intention. Therefore, Bhutto did not seek an appeal. While he was transferred to a cell in Rawalpindi Central Jail, his family appealed on his behalf, and a hearing before the Supreme Court commenced in May. Bhutto was given one week to prepare. Bhutto issued a thorough rejoinder to the charges, although Zia blocked its publication. Chief Justice S. N. Worrell Hawk adjourned the court until the end of July 1978, supposedly because five of the nine appeal court judges were willing to overrule the Lahore verdict. One of the pro Bhutto judges was due to retire in July. Chief Justice S. N. Worrell Hawk presided over the trial, despite being close to Zia, even serving as acting president when Zia was out of the country. Bhutto's lawyers managed to secure Bhutto the right to conduct his own defense before the Supreme Court. On 18 December 1978, Bhutto made his appearance in public before a packed courtroom in Rawalpindi. By this time he had been on death row for nine months and had gone without fresh water for the previous 25 days. He addressed the court for four days, speaking without notes. The appeal was completed on 23 December 1978. On 6 February 1979, the Supreme Court issued a guilty verdict, a decision reached by a bare four to three majority. The Bhutto family had seven days in which to appeal. The court granted a stay of execution while it studied the petition. By 24 February 1979 when the next court hearing began, appeals for clemency arrived from many heads of state. Zia said that the appeals amounted to trade union activity among politicians. On 24 March 1979 the Supreme Court dismissed the appeal. Zia upheld the death sentence. Bhutto was hanged at Central Jail Rawalpindi, on 4 April 1979, and was buried in village cemetery at Gari Kuta Bash. During his imprisonment, Bhutto's children Mortaza and Benazir worked on rallying the international support for the release of their father. Libya's Colonel Gaddafi sent his Prime Minister Abdus Salam Jaloud on an emergency trip to Pakistan to hold talks with Pakistan's military establishment for the release of Bhutto. In a press conference, Jaloud told the journalists that Gaddafi had offered General Zia to exile him to Libya, and Prime Minister Jaloud stayed in the Islamabad International Airport where the specially designated presidential aircraft waited for Bhutto. However, after a week of staying at the airport, General Zia rejected Prime Minister Jaloud's request and upheld the death sentence. Much of the Muslim world was shocked at Bhutto's execution. Before being hanged, Bhutto made a final speech and his last words were, O oh Lord, help me for I am innocent. On 4 April 1979, the day Bhutto was executed, the New York Times published its report after following the entire chronological events surrounding Bhutto's trial which stated in part, the way they did it, Bhutto is going to grow into a legend that will someday backfire. <laughs> Effects on Soviet Union and the United States Many political analysts and scientists widely suspected that the riots and coup against Bhutto were orchestrated with the help of Central Intelligence Agency and the United States government because of United States fears of Bhutto's socialist policies being seen as sympathetic to the Soviet Union, and said policies providing an opportunity to the Soviet Union to get involved in Pakistani politics. A former U.S. Attorney General and human rights activist, Ramsey Clark, is quoted in the New York Times as saying, I do not believe in conspiracy theories in general, but the similarities in the staging of riots in Chile where the CIA allegedly helped overthrow President Salvador Allende and in Pakistan are just too close. 
Bhutto was removed from power in Pakistan by force on 5 July, after the usual party on the 4th at the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad, with U.S. approval, if not more, by General Zia ul Haq. Bhutto was falsely accused and brutalized for months during proceedings that corrupted the judiciary of Pakistan before being murdered, then hanged. As Americans, we must ask ourselves this, is it possible that a rational military leader under the circumstances in Pakistan could have overthrown a constitutional government, without at least the tacit approval of the United States? Many of Pakistan's political scientists and historians and leading U.S. experts such as Ramsey Clark believed that Bhutto's removal and his execution was a singular and most dramatic change in world politics and a major setback for the Soviet Union who failed to realize the effects of Bhutto's execution on its own future in advance. Bhutto's death not only was a turning point in the Cold War, it also turned out to be one of the critical points in world politics since World War II, and a breakthrough in global power alignment. Eight months after Bhutto's death, the Soviet Union invaded the Afghanistan Soviet Socialist Republic, setting up a war that severely impacted the Soviet economy and led to the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the United States emerging as the single most powerful country in the world. Reopening of the Bhutto trial On 2 April 2011, 32 years after Bhutto's trial and execution, the PPP the ruling party at that time filed a petition at the Supreme Court to reopen Bhutto's trial. At the GEO News, senior journalist Iftikhar Ahmad aired a series of televised interviews with those who played a major and often controversial role in Bhutto's death. A legal team was organized by the Prime Minister Yusuf Raza Jalani's cabinet seeking to reopen the trial. President Asif Ali Zardari gave his consent to the resulting presidential order named Article 186 of the Constitution, the Supreme Court taking up the petition on 13 April 2011. Chief Justice Iftikhar Chaudhry eventually presided the three-judge bench although it was expanded with law experts from four provinces of Pakistan, while Minister of Law Babar Awan counseled Bhutto's case, with immediate effect, Babar Awan resigned as law minister, even leaving the Justice Ministry entirely in order to legally counsel Bhutto's case completely independently. In his noting remarks, Chief Justice Chaudhry praised and appreciated the move by the senior PPP leadership and remarked the gesture as historic. In a crucial advancement, the Supreme Court ordered the decision on the legal status of Bhutto's execution to a to be formed larger bench. After a series of hearings at the Supreme Court, the case was adjourned and dismissed after the PPP approved the suspension of Babar Awan on 2 May 2012. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Personal life. Bhutto married twice in his lifetime. His first marriage took place in 1943 when he married his cousin and first wife Shireen Amir Begum. In 1951, he married Begum Nusrat Ispahani on September 8, 1951. The couple had four children, Benazir, Mortaza, Sanam, Shanawas. There was also news of an alleged affair between Bhutto and a Bengali girl named Husna Sheikh. According to some media reports, she was his secret wife. Legacy Bhutto remains a controversial and largely discussed figure in Pakistan. While he was hailed for his nationalism, Bhutto was roundly criticized for intimidating his political opponents. By the time Bhutto was given the control of his country in 1971, Pakistan was torn apart, isolated, demoralized, and emotionally shattered after a psychological and bitter defeat at the hands of its bitter rival India. His political rivals had blamed his socialist policies for slowing down Pakistan's economic progress, as they caused poor productivity and high costs. However Bhutto and co. countered that they were merely addressing the massive inequality built up over the Ayub Khan years. Bhutto is blamed by some quarters for causing the Bangladesh Liberation War. In 1977, General Zia ul Haq released former General Yahya Khan from prison and his Lieutenant General Faisal Haq gave him the Honorary Guard of Honor when the former general died in 1980. After being released from house arrest after the 1977 coup, Yahya said, It was Bhutto, not Mujib, who broke Pakistan. Bhutto's stance in 1971 and his stubbornness harmed Pakistan's solidarity much more than Sheikh Mujib's six point demand. 
It was his high ambitions and rigid stance that led to rebellion in East Pakistan. He riled up the Bengalis and brought an end to Pakistan's solidarity. East Pakistan broke away. Other army men who lay blame for 1971 on Bhutto include future President Pervez Musharraf and East Pakistan's former martial law administrator Syed Muhammad Hassan. Bhutto is also often criticized for human rights abuses in Baluchistan by hardline Islamists as well as conservatives. Bhutto's actions during the 1970s operation in Baluchistan are also criticized for failing to bring about a lasting peace in the region. Bhutto's international image is more positive, casting him as a secular internationalist. Domestically, despite the criticism, Bhutto still remains Pakistan's most popular leader. During his premiership, Bhutto succeeded in uniting all the parties in getting the 1973 constitution enacted. His determined and aggressive embrace of nuclear weapons for Pakistan has made him regarded as the father of Pakistan's nuclear deterrence program, which he pursued in spite of Pakistan's limited financial resources and strong opposition from the United States. In 2006, The Atlantic described Bhutto as demagogic and extremely populist, but still Pakistan's greatest civilian leader. Even though Henry Kissinger developed differences with Bhutto, in his 1979 memoir White House Years he conceded that Bhutto was "...brilliant, charming, of global stature in his perception, a man of extraordinary abilities, capable of drawing close to any country that served Pakistan's national interests." While, Bhutto's former law minister Maraj Muhammad Khan described Bhutto as "...a great man but cruel." His family remained active and influential in politics, with first his wife and then his daughter becoming leader of the PPP political party. His eldest daughter, Benazir Bhutto, was twice Prime Minister of Pakistan, and was assassinated on 27 December 2007, while campaigning for 2008 elections. While his son, Mortaza Bhutto, served as the member parliament of Pakistan, and was also assassinated in a controversial police encounter, Rodad Khan, former statesman who served under Bhutto, further wrote in his book, Pakistan, a dream gone sour, that after 1971, Bhutto started extremely well, bringing the isolated, angered, apprehended, and dismembered nation back into her feet and gave the respectable place in the world, in a shortest period. With a gift of giving the nation a parliamentary system and furthermore the ambitious successful development of atomic bomb program in a record time, are his greatest achievements in his life, for Pakistan and her people, but sadly deteriorated at the end. Bhutto remains highly influential in country's public, scientific, and political circles, his name yet continues to resonate in Pakistan's collective memory, with all the criticism and opposition, Bhutto remained highly influential and respected figure even after his death. Bhutto is widely regarded as being among the most influential men in the history of Pakistan. His supporters gave him the title Quaid e Awam, leader of the people. Topic: <inaudible> Eponyms. Shahid Dufakar Ali Bhutto Institute of Science and Technology, a science and engineering institute named after Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, located in Karachi, Sindh of Pakistan. Za Bhutto Agricultural College, an agriculture engineering and science college named after Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, located at Larkana, Sindh, Pakistan. F-22P Zufakwar class frigate, Pakistan Navy combatant vessel ordered in April 2006, launched July 2009. Zufakarabad, a planned city in Thatta district of Sindh, Pakistan. The city is named after in the memory of the Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. <laughs> Books See also Ginwa Bhutto List of Presidents of Pakistan List of Prime Ministers of Pakistan Movement for the Restoration of Democracy